Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, today we have Tanya, who's a third year PhD student in Carsten's lab here at Yale, uh, talking about the, the project eight results that uh, recently we put up on the archive. Um, so yeah, Tanya's a PhD student here. She works on the project eight experiment, which aims to measure the neutrino mass uh, through tritium beta decay. Um, previously, Talia worked on um, interpretations of quantum mechanics using neutrinos, so always in neutrinos. Uh, she holds an MA in political science from the University of Chicago and a BS in physics from MIT. So take it away. Thank you so much. All right, good to see you all. As you just heard, I'm Cal Weiss, and I'll be talking about the first neutrino mass limit to be obtained using cyclotron radiation spectroscopy. So Here's what I'll talk about today. First, I'll give you some background on direct neutrino mass measurements using beta decay. And I'll talk about the two experiments that use this method, Catrin and the focus of this talk today, Project 8. Then I'll describe Project 8's first neutrino mass limit. So that's the result that just came out from our phase two. And to wrap up the presentation, I'll tell you about some next steps to improve neutrino mass sensitivity and talk a little bit about what else we could learn with Project 8. So, the discovery that neutrinos are massive, as many of you know, earned the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. And we know this because the measured flavor state oscillates since it's a superposition of mass states. And this is the understanding what the neutrino mass actually is, is a key open question in particle physics. So there are a few reasons why we care about this question. One is that neutrinos lightness among fermions is really a mystery. Um, we don't know whether this is a problem, but it seems to at least hint that something unusual is going on. Um, you can see the fermion masses other than neutrinos up here and the neutrino masses down here to give a sense of the scale. Um, this is log scale. Another reason why we care about the neutrino mass is that knowing the neutrino mass could potentially inform the theory of the beyond the standard model. So we know that there has to be some beyond the standard model physics going on just because we know that the neutrinos are massive. Because either the neutrino mass is explained by a Majorana mass mechanism, which would be new physics, or uh, if the uh, neutrino gets its mass from a Higgs-like particle, that would mean that there is some unobserved particle out there, which is the right hand of neutrino, and there has to be a, a reason why we're not observing it. So either way, there's something important and we need to learn. And in addition, the neutrino mass is an input to models of the early universe, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So the method I'm discussing for measuring the neutrino mass is choosing tritium beta decay, and this really relies at its core on energy conservation. So what's going on is you have a neutron decaying into a proton and releasing an electron and an electron antineutrino. We measure the energies of these electrons, which gives us this beta spectrum. And in doing so, we figure out how much missing energy is carried away by the mass of that neutrino. So here you can see the tritium beta spectrum over its 18 keV. It ends at this endpoint, denoted as E naught over here. And the part of the spectrum that concerns us is a tiny little portion near the endpoint. Uh, this blow up is maybe even conservative. Um, and you can see here that the neutrino mass scale represented with this parameter M beta uh, really affects the shape of the spectrum near, right near the endpoint. So what we're looking for is we're trying to distinguish between these spectra to infer the neutrino mass. So this parameter M beta is defined like this. It is a weighted sum of the neutrino masses squared using the PMNS matrix element. So I want to break down the beta spectrum a little bit to see what's going on here. So you have an electron phase space density term. So these are the states available to the electron in the decay. And this gives you an overall rate um, due to couplings and a matrix element. There are some uncertainties here, but thankfully we pretty much don't care about this because we only need to use the shape of the spectrum, not the overall rate to determine the neutrino mass. Um, then there's a term which we do care about because it depends on the electron momentum. And this term is capturing the interaction of the electron with the nucleus, the coulomb interaction. And this really produces this dip over here that you see. Then we have the states available to the neutrino. So there's a sum over the neutrino mass state. And there's also a shape distortion that is um, in this sum that is produced by the neutrino masses mi. And so this is the effect we're looking for. Um, this term also depends on the neutrino energy, which can be calculated from the endpoint, E naught, that's the total energy available in the decay, and the electron kinetic energy. So 
we're using the spectrum and specifically we're using the tritium spectrum. And so why tritium decay? Well, it has a, a relatively low endpoint of 18 keV. And that matters because if the endpoint is low, then this um, neutrino energy is generally lower um, compared to the neutrino mass of MI. So the masses can then have a bigger overall effect on the shape of the spectrum, making this an easier uh, effect to measure. Also, the tritium decay has a relatively reasonable half-life, if not the age of the universe, and there's a simple spectrum. So there aren't forbidden states that interfere with the endpoint, which is the case for um, some other uh, isotopes that one might use. So there's a second unknown that is important to this, uh, this enterprise, which is the neutrino mass ordering. So you can see here the neutrino masses in the normal and the inverted ordering as a function of the lightest neutrino mass. Um, which of these is actually happening um, isn't yet answered by oscillation experiments. And you can see here that even as the lightest neutrino mass gets very small, um, the the three neutrino masses still um, have to have some non-zero mass. So if you take this limit um, for the normal ordering case, you get that this m beta parameter that's calculated using those PMNS matrix elements has to be at least nine milli electron volts. And for the inverted ordering case, it has to be at least 50 mil electron volts. So if using a tritium beta decay experiment, we measure a neutrino mass that is less than this, that would uh, rule out the inverted order. But on top of that, we can actually learn a bit more um, because you saw that the spectrum was that weighted, was um, from a weighted sum of different terms corresponding to the neutrino masses. And each of those terms has a different endpoint because the, the neutrino mass shifts the endpoint. So here you can see that you have the pinks in the spectrum corresponding to the different neutrino masses. So if you had a perfect beta spectrum with amazing resolution and lots of statistics, you could resolve individual neutrino masses and also see the difference between the different mass orders. So this, what I've been talking about, direct measurement is one of the three main neutrino mass probes. Um, and in this case, really neutrinos can have any properties you want and your mass measurement is robust. So that's really why we like this method so much. It's kind of the ultimate model independent benchmark. Um, but we can learn a lot of other methods too. Um, neutrino with double beta decay produces limits on the neutrino mass if the mass, it does in fact turn out to be Majorana. Um, and uh, cosmology produces limits on the sum of the neutrino masses. Um, and those depend on a number of factors, both cosmological and in terms of neutrino properties. In the case of cosmology, it depends on things like the expansion rate of the universe as a function of time and the large scale structure as a function of time. So there is a, a, quite a few variables at play in that case. But on the other hand, this is producing the most stringent um, limits at the moment. I just have a quick question. Yeah. So you, you're talking about tritium. Suppose we looked at it another, um, another decay. Would it have a totally different shape better, but just even though in some ways, but worse than others? Mm -hmm. I mean, tritium has its own properties, so I'm just curious whether the other channels that you could look at would have a different shape spectrum that would have advantages. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in terms of advantages, I mean, so there is another experiment that's now using CRESS um, that is called Helium-6 CRESS, and they're looking at um, a few different elements, um, uh, Helium-6, Neon, um, and by doing that, they're actually able to look at both um, beta decay and uh, look at um, uh, the emission of both neutrinos and antineutrinos, so both electrons and positrons. Um, and in doing that, they can kind of subtract off the spectra and learn about their systematics better. So that's one case where like having spectra of different shapes mm -hmm. can actually teach you something more. Um, I think in the case of though trying to do what we're trying to do. Um, the problem is that there aren't basically any other spectra that have that aren't don't have many complicated factors to analyze or have higher endpoints such that you have very few events. So nobody's found really a good alternative, even though people are constantly trying to look for other elements mm -hmm. that might work. That's a really good question. Thank you. So now I want to talk about Kepler and Project E, which are the two experiments that are using this method. So the Catherine experiment is really the state of the art experiment in direct mass measurements. So the challenge for all direct mass experiments 
up to this point and now is how do you really precisely measure the energies of those beta electrons in the endpoint? So Catherine does it using something called a mass E spectrometer. Um, you can see a picture of it here being moved to, um, to where it is sitting in Germany. And it's the largest ultra high vacuum vessel in the world. A little bit about how it works. So uh, electrons have to traverse a potential barrier, which can be shifted. And in doing so, an integral spectrum is produced. And these electrons are guided through the spectrometer using magnetic fields. And the energy resolution of this uh, depends on um, the ratio of magnetic fields at different points, um, which can, you can get a better ratio if you make the spectrometer really big. Um, so that is what might be required to in, uh, further improve the sensitivity. So this, this is data from Catrin. Um, you can see the beta spectrum near the endpoint. And these error bars are actually inflated by a factor of 50. So they have an incredibly precise spectrum. This produces the leading direct mass limit, um, which is 0.8 eV. And Catrin is working towards the final sensitivity of 0.2 eV. So the sensitivity is limited by physical volume scaling, which I just mentioned. And it's getting to the point where to push much further in sensitivity, the experiment might need to be kind of exorbitantly large. Um, and so uh, right now they're working on some improvements to what they're doing with Catherine, but not really planning a bigger one because it just gets too big. Um, and the other limiting factor is the systematic uncertainty that is produced by the molecular rotational and vibrational states of the decay products, which is helium free bound tritium. So what happens is that the um, that, that molecule can be in different energy states. And that means that there are different amounts of energy available in the decay for the electron and the neutrino. So that produces a broadening in the beta spectrum, which looks like this, um, which is sort of a, an irreducible systematic at the end. And the possible is to semester amount this would be to use um, atomic trick. There are a whole host of challenges that come with that, um, as you might imagine, because uh, tritium likes to stay uh, in a molecule. So what is the, the next step here? Well, we're trying to work on that in Project 8. So Project 8 is working towards a final, hopefully, neutrino mass sensitivity of 0.04 eV. And there are two main uh, parts of what we're doing. One is using atomic tritium. Um, we're working towards that. And the other is using a novel spectroscopy technique, cyclotron radiation emission spectroscopy, or CRAS, which was developed by Project 8. So here's how it works. Um, you have um, tritium, uh, which decays to produce uh, electrons, and those, that uh, tritium is placed in a background magnetic field represented by this arrow, as well as a magnetic trap to keep the electrons in. Then um, this electron in the magnetic field undergoes cyclotron motion, which causes it to emit cyclotron radiation, and that radiation has to be detected in some way. The frequency of the cyclotron radiation is related to the electron kinetic energy, using the uh, formula from special relativity for cyclotron radiation. So how do we actually set up this prep experiment? Well, we have our background magnetic field, which is supposed to be relatively uniform. And in addition to producing the cyclotron motion, that also serves to trap the electron frequency. But unless the electron momentum is exactly mm -hmm. perpendicular to the magnetic field, it's going to fly right away, and we won't be able to observe it for very long. So we also need an axial trap um, in the Z direction here. Um, which causes the electrons to bounce back and forth axially. Then cyclotron radiation is emitted and we have to detect it in some way, either using a waveguide, using a resonant cavity, or using an antenna. So this produces the event spectrogram that you see here on the right, um, the characteristic crest track. So this start frequency, so this is I should say frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And the start frequency is the cyclotron frequency of the electron at the moment right after it decays. So that corresponds to the energy that the electron has right after the decay. So that's really what we want to find out is what frequency does this whole event start at. Um, but there's lots of other things that happen after um, that start frequency. In particular, we have these upward sloping tracks, which are produced by energy loss as the electron is undergoing is, is um, emitting radiation, it's losing energy to the radiation. And you have these jumps, which are energy loss from inelastic scattering of the electrons with gases that are present. And so here, energy loss um, causes frequency gain because there's an inverse relationship between energy and frequency here. So all of this matters in part because it allows us to identify our events. And this is actually a very low background technique because it's difficult to mimic this characteristic structure. 
Um, and it's also important because sometimes, as I'll talk about later, you miss these earlier facts and you end up reconstructing later parts of the event at the start of the event, which is not something that you want. So Project 8 has completed two of its phases thus far. Um, phase one involved the first detection of cyclotron radiation from individual electrons, and it used this krypton, which I'll talk about a little more later, but this produces really nice monoenergetic lines that we can use for calibration. Um, this is actually the first uh, event with press, the one you saw on the previous slide, um, and easy scale resolution was achieved. Um, now we're just, we've just wrapped up phase two, which produced the first tritium spectrum specifically with CREP, and also the first neutrino mass limit with CREP, which is what I'll talk about for uh, much of the rest of this talk. And uh, this was also the first time that systematics of CREP were characterized in detail, um, which is important because we're going to, you know, the relatively new methods, so there turned out to be a lot to learn um, that we didn't know before we started taking data, um, and that we'll be able to carry forward in future phases. So coming up will be phase three, which involves R&D both to scale up press and to um, supply and craft atomic tritium. And then those two will come together, those two components, um, into a pilot experiment and hopefully eventually a full sensitivity experiment. And you can see a schematic of something like what that might look like over here um, with uh, electrons in a uh, and, and atoms in a craft that is designed to actually uh, craft the atoms. So now we'll be talking about Project 8's first neutrino mass limit from phase two. So phase two produced a tritium beta spectrum with press. To do this, we had a magnetic field that was created by a one Tesla um, background MRI magnet, as well as these little trap coils inside. Um, and those are to trap the electrons actually. Um, this was uh, used with two gases, molecular tritium gas and this Krypton 83M gas for calibration. And we had a waveguide detector to detect the cyclotron radiation. So that produced this tritium spectrum that you see here on the right um, with a little under 4,000 events. And we didn't see any events beyond the endpoint of the beta spectrum. So it's really encouraging. Um, we, we set things up so that we would get 90% confidence less than one event in 100 days. We could data for 82 days and we see any events. So this suggested pretty good control of our noise and also um, validates press as a very low background technique. Um, that's really a selling point because you can imagine if you have a background here and then there's a little distortion of the beta spectrum due to the neutrino mass, that background can just swamp out your distortion. So it's important to get the background really low, which is something we're hopeful about for press in the future. So um, that allowed us to set this background right in here. So zooming in a little bit to this insert inside of the phase two apparatus, so this is about scale. Um, there's a gas port here into which, uh, through which um, krypton could go into the gas cell, um, or instead tritium could go in. Either way, um, electrons would be emitted. Those electrons are trapped by the trap coils that you see here. Um, and then they emit cyclotron radiation, which heads through the RF windows. In one case, it's terminated. In another case, it goes off to an amplifier. Um, and um, there's also this field shifting solenoid, which is used to slightly shift the background magnetic field. And we'll talk about that allows us to calibrate our detection efficiency as a function of energy. And then there are also other gases floating around, like hydrogen and helium. And these are a challenge because the electrons can scatter off of them, which creates those jumps in the event that you saw. So um, I want to talk about, yeah, go ahead. Another question. So the, when the, the gas line contains the tritium and then the, the beta particles, and so they scatter off the tritium too. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just put hydrogen here because in the end, it's like the tritium we want to have there, but the other gases we would rather do without. Because But you're right that like when we do sensitivity calculations for the future um, in a, a atom craft where you have much less of the other elements, then the factor that's really limiting for scattering is the tritium. So that does really matter. It's really important. Um, so you'll notice that we use a bunch of little traps instead of say one big trap. And that was because of an effect that's specific to a wave guy. So you'll see it, um, for example, if we use cavities in the future. And in particular, because the electron and the light are both propagating axially, um, the signal gets Doppler shifted by the motion of the electron. 
Um, and so that deletes the power of the main signal. And so this problem is not as bad if you have short traps. So we use multiple short traps. So that required us to combine the signals of those traps, and that was um, complicated for the analysis. So there are two magnetic trap configurations that we used. Um, and this um, question of how you set up the magnetic traps is very important for traps. So um, here is the deep trap, um, and here is the shallow trap. The scales on the axes, this one, the scale is a lot smaller. So this is, in fact, very shallow compared to that. Um, and how these traps work is, so this is theta is the angle between the electron momentum and magnetic field. And only angles um, above some value are trapped. And that value is determined by um, the ratio between the maximum and minim minimum field. So a deeper trap uh, with, with a larger range of magnetic field also maintains a larger range of these angles. So that has two consequences. Um, one is that a deeper trap has more events. And the second is that a deeper trap has worse energy resolution. Because you have electrons with these different angles relative to the magnetic field that are experiencing different average magnetic fields. And there's a larger range of fields that you get when you have a larger range of these pitch angles. Um, so this is a trade-off that we get. And then in the shallow trap, you get fewer events, but you get better energy resolution. I'll say this can be improved if you, for example, have flux while we're looking at for the future. So how do we go from a time series to a spectrum? So you have this gas cell here, the radiation goes up the waveguide and gets amplified. The signal gets downmixed, digitized, and a Fourier transform is performed um, to get this spectrogram of frequency versus time. And then um, there's a process of identifying the individual traps, reconstructing the full events, and then analyzing the spectra from the start frequency. And this process of track and event reconstruction, a lot of work on that has been done at Yale, including by Pranava back there. <laughs> um, so that's something that a lot of work has gone into here. So one of the main pieces of data that we got out of phase two was Krypton data in the shallow trap. So that's the high resolution trap. Um, so the decay chain here is rubidium-83 decays to krypton-83m, which is this metastable state that then decays to krypton-83m in the electron. Um, and this is a conversion electron, which means it's produced by an interaction between an uh, excited nucleus and an orbital electron that causes that electron to be ejected. Um, so you get these monoenergetic lines. Um, in this case, we had about a 2 EV full with half mass resolution produced by that range of electrons appearing from different magnetic fields and also having different reconstructive frequencies in the shallow trap. And that's on top of around a 3 EV natural line width of um, krypton. The final full width half mass that we'll need to reach our final target sensitivity is around 0.2 EV full width half mass, so about an order of magnitude more stringent. So we're, we're getting there, which is nice to see, um, although this needs to be combined with high statistics. Um, as you saw, there's some great off there. Uh, so we then took this one line and made it one point on this plot of energy versus frequency, where we took data for different krypton lines over this 18 keV range. And in doing so, we could see that you could fit all these points with one magnetic field value, which tells us that this press method is really working very consistently over a wide range. Um, the, the analysis region of interest for tritium is like a tiny little area over here. So this is really showing um, a robustness over a nice wide region. So now I'll talk about how we actually analyze the tritium data. This is a lot of what I have been working on with the team in Project E. Um, so there are two goals. One is to measure the tritium endpoint. This is a known quantity. And so if we can measure it, it validates our understanding of this new um, press technique. And the other is to place a limit on the neutrino mass. So to do this, we developed a model of this tritium data. We calibrated parameters in the model, including estimating their uncertainties, using Krypton data, and also using some simulations that we validated against the Krypton data. Um, and then we wanted to test that our model made sense. We did that with a Monte Carlo study. And finally, we fit the data with the model to produce endpoint and neutrino mass results. So the inference that was performed at the end of the data was performed with Bayesian and three campus inference. Um, so in the three campus approach, um, a parameter called m beta squared was fitted. Um, this parameter counterintuitively can actually be negative. What it's really capturing is how much shift you see in the endpoint squared relative to what you expect. So if it's negative, it suggests there's like some unaccounted for schematics and the neutrino mass is also what seems to fit with zero. This is how these analyses have actually traditionally been done for past um, 
direct mass experiments. Um, but you can take that M beta square parameter and use the Feldman cousin method to construct an upper limit on M beta. In this case, the uncertainties were propagated by incorporating nuisance constraints on parameters in the model, um, and also in some cases using Monte Carlo sampling. The Bayesian approach um, is really what I've been focused on. Um, in this case, the model was implemented in the STAN platform, which performs something called Markov chain Monte Carlo, that many of you know of. Um, this shows a schematic. So you have a multi dimensional parameter space and you have a likelihood as a function of these many parameters. The likelihood it includes both um, the model of the data and also the priors on each of the parameters. Uh, and Markov chains explore the space um, to go towards uh, high likelihood regions. And then they explore within those high likelihood regions, which allows them to construct the shape of a posterior probability distribution that tells you the probability of your parameter having different values at the end of the analysis. Um, in this case, the uncertainties were actually included in the priors on the nuisance parameters, and so they were propagated via this Monte Carlo sampling during uh, yeah. Okay, so how do we put together the model of this press data? Um, so this is what uh, this is a paper that we're working on, which will post into a lot of detail about this, a lot of what uh, we've been spending time on. So there are a few main features of press data. Um, one is the underlying spectrum. So it could be monoenergetic lines for krypton or the beta spectrum for tritium. In particular, the beta spectrum gets involved with this um, spectrum of molecular, rotational, and vibrational states. Um, we actually used this sparse representation, so we docked over here and numerically convolved them with this um, in order to get a pretty accurate picture, but also speed up computation time relative to using every single point. And this was a good enough approximation for um, our data. So that's the underlying spectrum. And then you also have the energy response function. So now you get into what is actually specific to press, what is happening to your press detector. So um, one effect that you see is the broadening from the range of magnetic fields. So here you see krypton data um, in red, and then in purple, what is what happens once that data is broadened. Um, by electrons experiencing different magnetic fields. And then you see this asymmetric tail over here. And that tail is produced by the inelastic scattering and missed crest tracks. So in particular, um, so I was talking before about how if you have the real start frequency is here, but let's say that first track is like low power and you don't detect it at all, then you will think that the start frequency is actually that. And by that point, you, might have, you will have lost energy due to um, energy going into the cyclotron radiation, and the electron will also lost, lost energy from scattering off of gases. Um, and so you'll you'll get uh, too high of an energy, uh, sorry, you'll get too low of an energy, and you'll end up in this tail here. And this tail is actually composed of a bunch of different peaks. Every peak corresponds to um, missing uh, a different number of tracks in the event, and then they get smoothed out into that tail. So this is um, what it looks like. And I, I should say this range of magnetic fields is something we're gonna be dealing with for a long time moving forward. But the scattering is not gonna be as big of a problem in the future. In particular, we didn't know how much of a challenge it would be. So our data like wasn't as clean to be able to really model this as we hoped. But also by the time we get to phase four, we're zooming into such a small region of the spectrum that the um, electrons that scatter elastically scatter right out of our ROI. And so we don't end up really having this problem as much um, in later phases. Um, so the last element of the model is the detection efficiency curve. So I mentioned that solenoid that was able to shift the magnetic field before. So that this that's what this, this is what the solenoid got us. So in particular, when we shifted the magnetic background shield field shift um, displayed here in the blue and red. Um, what that does is it means that for the same krypton energy, the same monoenergetic line, you detect a different frequency. So we could shift through different frequencies and see how the efficiency of detecting events changes. Um, so that's what we see here with these different krypton lines. Um, and this was done for all four tracks and then combined between the tracks to produce this gray curve that you see here. So this curve, um, captures effects from waveguide coupling, the coupling of the electrons to waveguide at different um, frequencies, and also some image noise from a low pass filter. Um, but what it's missing is any effects related to changing the energy. And really the krypton line is just that one energy. Um, and so that had to be modeled, but that is pretty well known um, 
so it can be predicted easily. So this in particular is the, the radiated power changes with energy. And so once that is incorporated, that gives us this detection efficiency line in green, which scales the spectrum. So putting this all together, we get our model. Um, so this is the number of expected events. There's a signal term and a background term. And the signal term is multiplied by a detection efficiency. We had an efficiency for each bin, so we did a bin analysis. And then the beta spectrum is convolved with this um, energy response function over here. So this is actually, we used a fully analytic model, so that sped up computation a lot. And we were able to validate the approximations in that analytic model using our Monte Carlo study. Okay. I'm sorry, it's mm -hmm. probably obvious, but why is there that feature in the deduction efficiency? And it's not obvious, it's, that's actually um, a mode feature. So okay. you have a cavity mode that causes the exactly. So this is a summary of the uncertainties that we ended up with. I haven't explained like every element of this, but I've explained sort of the core. Um, so these are contributions to the uncertainty on the endpoint. Um, and so we have a plus or minus 9 EV statistical uncertainty, and then plus or minus, or, uh, sorry, plus or minus 9 EV systematic uncertainty, and then 17 EV statistical uncertainty. And um, in here we have several systematic effects of similar sizes. Um, and in particular, you have the broadening, uh, well, you have the uncertainty on the mean magnetic field experienced by electrons, which we calibrate from Krypton data. Um, you have the broadening from the different magnetic fields. You have uncertainties on the scattering energy loss, including um, the gas composition, which we have to measure with RGAs, um, and the uh, rate at which those that tail drops down, uh, which depends on features of how we did the track and event reconstruction, as well as on the um, on the gas composition. And then there's the efficiency curve. Um, and this last thing here is you have some dependence of these parameters in your sector response on frequency, which we had to model also using a combination of Krypton data and simulation. So what do you get following the data after the first scattering? What, uh, that is why, isn't there enough information in that first segment? Because what you care about, there's the, the, the cyclotron loss rate and the start energy. Yeah. What, what are you gaining by adding those other pieces on? I see. So, um, Okay, so let's say you correctly identify this as the as the start frequency. Um, you don't technically need these other ones. And in fact, they're not very useful for determining what the start frequency is. So to determine what that start frequency is, you're just analyzing one track. So that's a very good point. The main way that these later tracks help is they allow you to see that this isn't noise. Like it's much easier to end up with a line just by chance for noise fluctuations than to end up with a bunch of lines that are discontinuous in frequency, but not time. So it's useful for saying this this isn't noise. This is actually an electron. It's not useful for figuring out this frequency. The frequency you just get from um, fitting a line to this, basically. Okay, but you know why I asked? Because you're getting extra noise from the uncertainty and the scattering. Hmm. So that comes from, let's say this first track is very low power which happens a lot of the time. In particular, electrons with certain pitch angles are trapped, but have too low power to be seen. Um, then what happens is you don't detect this first track, but then maybe it scatters and the pitch angle changes and all of a sudden it's at a pitch angle that increases the power. So then you'll detect the second track and you'll think that this is the first track. So you'll try to have to estimate how much energy has changed here because you don't know that this first track exists at all. Um, and so that's why we have to model the the scattering um, which produces the scale. Okay, but but you know if, if the track you see is the second track that they know with a known unknown first track, do you just know that because the energy is too high? You don't know. Okay. So what you essentially have is you you predict how often you expect to have um, you expect to have missed tracks. And you have parameters that describe that, and then you have to fit that to the data. Uh, but I should show this. In this case, you have this little bump here. This is produced in part from krypton specific effects, but it's also produced from missing the first track. So in this case, you have such good energy resolution that you can separate out 
the first track from missing the first track and seeing the second track. So that's really nice because then you know, like you're saying, you basically know whether it's from missing a track or not. But in this case, you blur together all of those peaks, and so you you don't know. Welcome. That's a great question. Okay, so I was just saying there's n plus uncertainties, and then for the neutrino mass, statistical uncertainty dominates quite a lot still. So my scaling options can gain quite a bit. So this analysis was validated with Monte Carlo studies, as I've mentioned. So the procedure here involves generating spectra that are as detailed as possible. So we use a numerical model instead of an analytic one. There are a number of assumptions that we avoid making when generating data. And that way, when we analyze with our approximated model, any effects of the approximation are seen in the results of these Monte Carlo studies. The other thing that we do is we sample inputs to the generator from the priors on each parameter. So those priors capture the uncertainties. And that way, when we do a whole ensemble of these Monte Carlo spectra, um, those spectra in, uh, include the range of expected values of parameters weighted by probability. So then when we finish an ensemble of these spectra, we can compute the bias um, in the uh, fitted results compared with the true values, and also how often the intervals contain the true values. So we do this for the endpoint and get a good coverage for one sigma interval. Um, there is a small negative best fit bias, the same in the Bayesian and frequency analyses, which we actually, there are a number of differences in how we specifically implemented things, so it's interesting to see that that's consistent. Um, and then the 90% neutrino mass limits have a good coverage as well. Um, and this is, I, I find, a, a fun plot. Um, this is the posterior neutrino mass as a function of the empty true neutrino mass. Um, so you can see in this black line is what you would get if the posterior equals the input. Um, the posterior mean is shown in red, and the 90% credible limit is shown in blue. Uh, and so you can see that the posterior mean is overestimated at low values, which makes sense because the actual value of the neutrino mass is zero, and all of your probability density has to be above zero because it's a positive mass. So you're always going to overestimate things there. That's expected. But then as the neutrino mass goes up, you approach the line that you expect. So we actually calculate this coverage at high values because the coverage is overestimated that low true neutrino mass does. This is another way to visualize this. Now on the y-axis is the difference between the posterior and true results as a function of the true results. And this is what happens if you try to put a lower limit on the neutrino mass. So at small values, you're not going to be able to. Um, you're just going to hit zero. And then as you get to large values, you're actually able to measure the neutrino mass, but it's fake it if you're not measuring it. Um, but the hope is that as you increase your sensitivity, um, you, you uh, move towards zero, the place at which you're starting to put that lower limit on mass. So here are our results. Um, we have Bayesian and frequency endpoint results um, with slightly different means and very similar uncertainty. There are also 90% confidence limits on the neutrino mass that are quite similar. And the endpoint result is just over one sigma from the literature value. Um, so here you can see the data in black with the Bayesian and frequency fits over top on in uh, blue and red respectively, and then Bayesian one sigma intervals in the light blue. Um, and then here at the end, um, in these little bars, these are the, this is the endpoint result that we get. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's just off from the uh, literature line. Here is a zoomed in set of contours for the frequency result. Um, so we have um, a paper that was uh, posted pretty recently on the archive on these results and additional papers dealing with variance aspects of the hardware and systematic and separation. Here is uh, a look at the Bayesian results specifically. So this is the neutrino mass on the y-axis and the endpoint on the x-axis. And here is the limit on the neutrino mass in blue um, with the best fit uh, value as a star compared with the literature value. I also just want to note, last point on phase two, um, that uh, there is uh, a lot more that can be learned from phase two data. And in particular, um, uh, Lee, who recently finished his PhD here, uh, has been focused on using deep learning to better reconstruct these events. Um, and so here is like a ground truth of an event, which might be smeared out with noise in the spectrogram. And then um, a, a deep learning algorithm can predict the math. Um, so uh, this is able to increase our efficiency of detecting the events. Okay, so that is all on phase two. And now I want to talk about what are the next steps that Project 8 is pursuing to improve neutrino mass sensitivity. 
So what's next? So we're working on phase three now. And one of the core aspects of phase three is scaling up the volume. We've got a pretty good neutrino mass limit in a centimeter cubed volume, um, but we need a much bigger volume to do better. So here uh, you can see these curves show the neutrino mass uncertainty, the standard deviation, this is limit, as a function of volume times efficiency times time. And these curves include different tritium densities. So if you have a higher density, you're going to get um, a, uh, you're going to, you're going to do better with your statistics. So here is the curve that corresponds to the density used in phase two. Um, and you can see that this analytic model, the point um, falls on the line, which is nice. Um, and here is the statistical dependence. Um, here is the R is the rate uh, of uh, of events and B is the background. Um, and so we can see that we could gain a lot by increasing in, uh, the size, but then we also are need to improve the systematic uncertainty. And to do that, among other things, we need to develop systems for atomic tritium. Um, and then finally, something that we're looking at for the future is reducing the cyclotron frequency from around 26 gigahertz where we've been to quite low, um, likely less than one gigahertz. So the motivation for that is this. The frequency is set by the magnetic field field. And atomic trapping, which we'll to move towards, also relies on magnetic field strength. Um, in particular, in a magnetic field, certain spin states are trapped of the atoms. So at one Tesla, or 26 gigahertz, where we've been up until now, interactions between atoms would cause a high rate of spin flips, resulting in the atoms no longer being trapped and escaping. And this would mess up our experiment. So it is important to go to the lower frequencies where the effect is lesser and we could um, combine press with the atomic medium. So I'm going to talk about some of the efforts going on to scale up into a larger volume. Um, so we need a new approach to detecting the radiation in a larger volume. And we're studying two approaches, antennas and resonant cavities. Cavities are currently the baseline technology. You can see here on the right um, the image of an electron. Oh, it's all battery. Mm -hmm. Image of the electron it says, <laughs> inside of the cavity. And then on the left, um, an image of an electron in, uh, radiating into free space that is then detected uh, with antennas. So there's been a lot of great work done on the antenna array uh, concept at Yale. Um, in particular, the idea is to combine correct signals from antennas in a ring, incorporating the phase differences expected between the different antennas. Um, so a uh, setup to uh, to investigate this was developed and built at Yale, as you can see here, by James and Arena, and then you can now working on it on the right, um, taking data. Uh, this was a 60 antenna array, and on the inside was the synthetic press source. So this is an antenna in the middle that produces radiation that looks a lot like that of a crest electron. So one of the main goals of this effort has been to benchmark simulations, which have um, been led by people including Penny. Um, and so the idea here is um, that these simulations um, uh, match pretty well to data with some real world effects that are currently being investigated. And this really benchmarks the simulation so that um, if we want to use this method in the future, we have a good sense of what real world effects are. So there is a paper um, that was recently published on the synthetic press antenna, and there is a paper on the antenna array. So the other main method is cavity press. Um, so right now, um, different groups in the collaboration are working on designing and building prototypes at a few different frequencies, working towards moving to those lower frequencies. Um, and lower frequencies enable, uh, lower frequencies correspond to larger cavities to the same mode. Um, which is great uh, because we need more statistics as well. Um, so uh, one of the main things that is being looked at is how to use rings or grooves to filter out unwanted modes in the cavities. Um, so a number of uh, approaches for that are being investigated. And we're also planning to work on a cavity press experiment at Yale. Um, so our, our goal here is to demonstrate, demonstrate press in a cavity, cavity at low frequency. So we're looking at around 1.5 gigahertz, which is the same as about 0.05 tesla. See a nice diagram here made by Arena um, that shows what the setup would look like, and you with a background magnetic field, a vacuum chamber, and krypton on the inside. So that's what we're working on here now. 
there are some challenges. In particular, the power is really low at these low frequencies. So at 26 gigahertz, it's uh, on the femtowatt scale. At 1.5 gigahertz, it's on the attawatt scale. So signal to noise is a big challenge that we're currently trying to better understand. Um, and the other uh, thing is that a, a highly uniform field is required, and um, this is a bit more challenging when you are dealing with low fields and uh, background effects um, in the lab or the earth field so might be more concerning. The other prong of phase three is atomic tritium development, as I said. So currently, there are a couple test bands that are cracking uh, hydro uh, molecular hydrogen into atomic hydrogen. And this requires some real R&D because it needs to be done for project data higher uh, flow rates than have, are typically available. Uh, and so next, that's going to be done for tritium. And also R&D is going to be worked on for cooling and trapping atoms, which um, is, is being planned at a few institutions. And here is a conceptual design for a craft experiment with atomic tritium. So you can see you have a cracker to produce the um, atoms from molecules. Uh, and then the atoms are cooled um, through a multi-step process before being trapped in an experiment like this. Um, we're looking at, at this point, like a, a 10 meter cube to, um, for a, a more full scale experiment. So what else could we learn with this project eight experiment um, if we are uh, able to move towards the neutrino mass sensitivity that we're targeting? Well, a neutrino mass measurement could teach us about cosmology. Um, so, in particular, as the universe expanded, the neutrinos changed from radiation to matter, and that imprinted on the large scale structure of the universe. Uh, and so, because of that, we can learn from various probes from the CMB, from galaxy clusters, and from the Lyman Alpha Forest what is the upper limit on the, the sum of the neutrino mass of sigma. Right now, the upper limit that's being reported is around 0.1 to 0.2 eV. But there are quite a few parameters in this model. Um, and so the neutrino mass is one of the few cosmological parameters that's actually measurable in the lab. So we can input this, but it enables better determination of parameters that have to come from cosmology, like the Hubble constant and dark energy equation. Um, and this is the equation of this. And this is particularly important um, given that there is uh, the Hubble tension, um, tension between early and late universe determinations of the Hubble constant. So constraining degrees of freedom could be important for understanding what's going on with cosmology. And if a lab result actually contradicts cosmology, that could suggest that new neutrino properties or ingredients in the standard model of cosmology are required. Um, so for example, if the neutrino is uh, very, very long lived, but does eventually decay, that can relax these bounds by an order of magnitude. So small things can have a, doesn't really mean small, that's a new property, mm -hmm. but can have a pretty big effect. Um, and I wanted to show this plot here. This shows if you had a phase four project eight experiment that was able to get to this 40 MeV sensitivity as the neutrino mass approached zero, when you increase the larger neutrino masses, um, you're actually able to constrain your neutrino mass much better. So if it turns out that the neutrino mass is larger than we would expect, or that seems to be the case in cosmology, you actually get a pretty robust contradiction from direct measurements um, versus cosmology. So that would be very interesting. The last thing I want to talk about is searching with sterile neutrinos for Project E. Um, so this is something that Pranava has actually worked on a lot. So just like how I showed that the different active states produce these kinks in the spectrum because they have different um, they have different places where the spectrum ends, um, a sterile neutrino state would have a similar effect. So the spectrum is this weighted sum of the uh, spectrum that depends on the active mass and a uh, spectrum that depends on the zero mass. So the location of this kink in the spectrum would be determined by the mass of the zero neutrino. And then the size of the kink would be determined by the size of this missing parameter theta. So Project 8 plans to search for EV scale zero neutrinos, including in its um, next phase. Um, and the sensitivity um, is dominated by statistical uncertainty. Um, so you can see here the um, expected Project 8 sensitivity to zero neutrinos um, for phase three up there with molecular tritium, phase three with atomic tritium, and then phase four um, compared to anom right after anomalies and specifically the best anomalies. Um, so this, you can see the EV scale uh, picture um, displayed here. But depending on a detection readout scheme, if you can look far enough down in the spectrum, you could potentially search for KEV scale sterile neutrinos. 
So we want to summarize what I talked about. So as I discussed, the tritium beta spectrum enables model independent limits on the neutrino mass and hopefully eventually a model independent measurement. Um, Project 8 is an experiment that measures electron energies using cyclotron radiation in a method called PREP. Project 8 phase 2 just wrapped up and it produced the first neutrino mass limit with PREP um, in a centimeter cube scale uh, volume of gas. And this demonstrated um, high resolution and also the low background capability of PREP, which makes us hopeful for the future. Uh, and one of the major aspects of phase two is also to characterize a lot of the systematics, which is which is much of how I've been spending my time. So looking to the future, we're going to have R and D to scale up and for atomic tritium, enabling improved sensitivity to the active neutrino mass, but also potentially the stale neutrino. Right. Thank you. I'm going to now show great pop project eight collaborators at Yale. Uh, always wonderful to work with you and the project eight collaboration. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions about it? Yeah. Okay. I forget what the title is. We had a plot of these sensitivities or um, uncertainties. And there was a, like, a three and four for some reason. I'm wondering why the yes, one is flowing happens at three different points. Uh, you, you said why it happened at three different points? Oh, well, yeah. Why what caused this flow? Yeah. So the flooring has caused like systematic uncertainty. So in this case up here, um, this floor was produced by our energy resolution in phase two. So mostly the broadening due to electron disappearance in different magnetic fields. So we plugged in the, um, the measured energy broadening to the sensitivity formula in that case. Um, and in these cases, the floor, it, the floor is caused by predictions of what sort of energy broadening we could achieve. Um, including accounting in the dotted red lines case um, for uncertainties from those molecular appliances. But then the floor happens a little bit later for the atomic case um, because you've removed that systematic uncertainty. Um, so yeah, basically that's what you're hitting the systematic floor and you um, you can't help your sensitivity even if you get worse. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the uh, spectrogram you showed earlier. Um, so I'm just kind of trying to get why why is the uh, energy drop? In other words, why is the frequency uptick um, when there's no scattering? I assume there's no scattering. Oh, like in a given yeah, track, exactly. right? What's, what, uh, what is that? Yeah, that's a good question. So your electron is undergoing cyclotron motion, and it is doing so it is emitting radiation. So it's losing energy to that radiation. So the radiation is carrying away power that has to be detected. And so as it's doing that, the electron is just losing energy to the radiation that it's emitting due to its cyclotron acceleration. Um, so as it loses that energy, um, it, it, that's a continuous process during the, the phase of the continuous during the radiation emission. Um, and if you look back at the cyclotron frequency formula, if um, the energy um, decreases, cyclotron yeah. frequency yeah. increases. So then we get that upward slope. What determines the rate of energy dissipation? Mm, that's a good question. So in this case, it's the coupling of the electron um, to the waveguide. So it is how much, um, so there's like a, a dot product between the electron and the waveguide right. mode, right? That determines how much energy goes into the waveguide. Um, but if you, for example, had an electron radiating in free space with antennas, you wouldn't have that coupling with the waveguide mode. Instead, you'd have uh, an equation for how a particle radiates in free space. Um, so, but yeah, it can be predicted. It's easier to predict in some ways, I think, in a free space case, um, because uh, you don't have to worry about how you model your mode structure. Especially the result. It's a result of the waveguide, but you still do have the effect if you didn't have a waveguide and were just in free space, because you would still have the electron radiating just due to its cycle transition. It would just be a different slope in terms of how fast it's losing energy. And actually, kind of a fun thing is there, I don't have an image of this here, but um, uh, helium, I think Frederick has seen this in the past and recently, helium 6 press saw what happens when 
in the middle of a track, you kind of hit a mode. And so you have a quick change in the slope because you're radiating power more quickly and then the slope evens out. You actually kind of see changes in the slopes in individual tracks based on the wave dynamics. Yeah. All right. So that's all these systematic areas you're hammering on. Yeah. It's the one where you don't know if it's really the start or not significant compared to the other one. It's about the same size as the other one. Um, let me go to this. This one doesn't take me too long there. Um, so this effect is the scattering energy law um, in here. So like for the endpoint, it's a plus or minus six EV effect. And the other systematics are on a similar order. Um, I will say this effect started out much larger, like when we did kind of the first version of the analysis, because it was something we knew so little about and hadn't been analyzed with fresh before. And then we did like a lot of analysis of the RGA data to do it more carefully and to better understand cross sections. And we did more simulations to try to see whether we could um, reproduce what we're seeing in our data. And we're able to get that uncertainty down. Um, yeah. But, but if you go to a larger volume and clean your source home gas, it would stay small, right? Compared mm -hmm. to everything else. I mean, it yeah. would be larger compared <laughs> to everything else. I see what you're saying. Um, it depends how well you know things. So one of the reasons why that, that uncertainty is the size that it is, is because we didn't know that we would need super good gas composition data before we started. So we had this like sort of not very precise RGA data um, that we had to try to analyze. And there was also at some point um, a deuterium contamination. So we had to, we couldn't easily distinguish deuterium from helium for all these things that like, we didn't know we're gonna have a big effect before we started. Um, and I think in future experiments, we're gonna know to plan for them really carefully with a very good mass spectrometer um and be able to constrain the gases and therefore the gas fractions and therefore predict what that energy loss spectrum looks like more um and the other thing which i mentioned briefly is um so in phase four like so to get your our final sensitivity you have so many statistics you need so many statistics but you only have to analyze a region that is um 10 ev um from the endpoint and the, for example, hydrogen scattering will scatter the electron right out of that region of interest. So basically at that stage, you don't, you don't need to worry about, um, you, you, at that stage, you don't need to worry about this effect quite as much. And the other thing is that if you do atomic trapping, uh, you are constraining which atoms and molecules can stay in there because anything that doesn't have the right spin states is going to leave. So you're not going to have as many residual gases. So this is actually one of those effects that is more annoying at the demonstrator stage than the final stage, but we have to understand it in order to make sure we know what is happening in our data so that we can build up. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of a naive question. So how do you, or what effect is it that the ultimate sensitivity for this experiment? It's a great question. So um, maybe go back to this slide, maybe it's not that far away. Mm. Yeah, okay. So the ultimate sensitivity is set by, typically this line is like about half statistics and half systematic, so it's pretty even size effects um, by the time you get to 40 MeV. Um, but if you're looking at um, where that line is evening out, it tends to be set by, first of all, your ability to make your magnetic fields really flat. So we talked about, um, well, I won't show it, but we talked about those traps and how you have different magnetic fields, oh, sorry, different electrons that go further up in the trap experience different magnetic fields on average. So if you don't know exactly what magnetic field an electron is experiencing, you're gonna end up with a broadening of the reconstructed frequencies. So that effect remains. And so we've been investigating like how flat can you make can you make a magnetic trap in the middle? Um, and also magnetometry techniques, um, different techniques to know the magnetic field really well. Um, so the ultimate sensitivity in that case is gonna be set by a combination of knowing the magnetic field um, and making a flat field. And then there's another feature, which is if you can know the positions of the electrons, which we don't currently know, that helps you 
um, because then you, if you know, if you've mapped the field and you know where an electron is, um, then you can say, okay, when it was there, this is the field that was experiencing. Um, so like one of the benefits of the antenna array approach is that by doing your um, beam forming, by looking at the phase offsets from different antennas, you can figure out where the electron is. And right now we're investigating, could you do something similar in a cavity or at least some portion of that so that you can try to um, deal with that system. Um, and then I think just to uh, be complete in the answer, um, one more thing I'll say is that there is, so the density, so I, I mentioned this um, effect uh, of track losses. This effect also gets worse at higher densities. So that is a limiting factor because you can only put so many atoms into your system before you start getting trap losses. The reason having a problem in those big systems with tracking a bunch of uh, mm -hmm. signals at once? So the answer is yes and no. So um, the, the decay, because only like um, one in every 10 to the 13th decay is happens near the end point and the lifetime is 12.3 years, you, even in a very large system, um, you don't get that many decays that are right near the end point. So you would still be getting about like three decays in the region you care about per second and you don't have like high level issues, um, probably. But the challenge is that if we want to reconstruct Detail. If we want to reconstruct features of these electron events, um, we need to be able to see sideband frequency. So, in particular, what that means is the electron is moving back and forth quickly. This my diagram. The electron is moving back and forth in the magnetic trap, and that produces. Oh, I'm not going to get this. That produces um, a different axial frequency, which produces a separate frequency line. So if you want to reconstruct the pitch angle of the electron to figure out what magnetic field is expected to be experiencing, you need to also see those other lines. And those are on the spectrum, in which case you have to increase your detection energy region, and you would get a bunch of other beta events that you don't really care about. So that is something that we're assessing, is in particular in cavities, like how big of an effect is this? And I think we're going to need some tests to really and some lab tests in addition to our predictions to really know. Um, but that could be a problem because you could end up having like two genes in the spectrum and start seeing high lines. Okay. Uh, are there any questions from Sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, it doesn't look like it. Uh, in that case, we have uh, some coffee and cake for everyone to stick around and maybe talk some more about the, uh, the seminar. But otherwise, let's thank Tanner again for a great talk.